Hi, today we have, we're meeting with Laura Berenita from Danova and Natia Penn is Shreeli from Women's Initiative Support Group. And both of them uh, are uh, the part of the people who won a case, a, a case, a case against Georgia in a European Court of Human Rights regarding 2012 demonstrations. That's what we're going to talk about. So, can you tell me more about that case? I think it's fair that no one starts in a case because it's always a deeper organization. Um, yeah. Can you be more specific? Like, what you're interested in? Uh, what is it about? Um, okay. So, what happened, um, like to cover like, the, the background information, is that in 2013 we organized a demonstration which was violently attacked. Actually, 2012, sorry. Um, which was violently attacked by the country demonstrators, which was led by Orthodox clergy. Mm -hmm. And then when the when we called the police, the police did arrive but a bit later and then when they arrived they just stood and watched the violence mm -hmm. happen and they didn't really intervene. Mm -hmm. But and when they started intervening, the only thing that they did was to catch the not the violators, but the people who were um, the victims of the violence, right? Mm -hmm. Um and then um there were only I think as far as I remember two or three people who were then detained, but they were only charged one hundred body for a minor um, law offense, which was not enough as we um, activists and the people who were participating in the event thought. And then we um, asked um Idenova to um, pursue the case uh, to um, so that the police would investigate everything that happened during the, the demonstration. Uh, unfortunately, Georgian law enforcement um, and court um, systems were not enough. Mm -hmm. And after we exhausted all of the possibilities in Georgia, we went to the European Court because we were not satisfied by the process that were, ha that were happening here. And um, um, so the European Human Rights Court accepted our case mm -hmm. and stated that, that it's valid to be uh, discussed. Mm -hmm. And then it was um, unprecedented because they reviewed the case within a very short period and they issued the ruling right before um, 17th of May this year mm -hmm. so that it would make like um, a statement from the EU that how the, such kind of demonstration mm -hmm. should be protected and what, um, what measurements um, should the government take in this kind of situation. So if you um, look at the, um, read the ruling, it is mostly, it speaks mostly about the standards that the government should do and should protect and should ensure the measurements and like activities mm -hmm. considering the existing homophobic situation in Georgia how the government should handle such kind of situations it goes like step by step like it's like recommendations to the government how it should act in this kind of situations mm -hmm. so this is what we wanted to have and this can be used as a tool in future um, demonstrations mm -hmm. to tell that hey you government you have this um, complete list of things that you're supposed to do in this kind of situation and now it's up to you because before that uh, there were some um, kind of um, discussions that government was not prepared, government didn't know, government doesn't know, whatever. Now it's more um, solid and has like, a, it's, it's being listed on the official paper so everything, they can, will not have any counter arguments mm -hmm. to not protect us anymore. <laughs> And it's on, it doesn't only um, um, connect with LGBT movement, but generally with the minority movements mm -hmm. and the demonstrations that might be um, attacked. Mm -hmm. And also, as I read in the in the press release, all of the partic all the com participants of the demonstration, they well, those who complained, who uh, applied for 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 the court they have to be paid by the government, right? Yes, um, there is uh, some fine that the government has to pay to the um, victims, but <clears throat> I would not, um, my opinion is that the money in this case is not that important, mm -hmm. because for us it was, I mean, I mean, I can speak for myself, right, but I do believe that in most of the activist cases, um, our main, um, intention was not to get the money from the government and but to claim that we were violently attacked and our human basic human rights were violated mm -hmm. and the, the government's activities were not sufficient and in the future we have to be protected and our vulnerability has to be recognized mm -hmm. and this adequate measure should be taken from the government this is the most important part i think i believe in this ruling not the money Although um, I believe that the fact that the government
want to actually pay for something that they failed to do or um, yeah, because they failed to protect the demonstration is also an additional measure in this case because um, um, our economic system is not that great and the government is constantly, constantly complaining that there is no money for human rights and this time they have to pay. I mean, how we are going to use the, 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 this compensation, um, it's completely up to us and uh, that could be used in, in, in a good way for the, for the good of community as well. So, um, while I mean, primarily I agree with that one because it, it was more of an issue of a principle, an issue of um, the fact that our rights were violated, that our demonstration wasn't protected, um, that fact should have been acknowledged and it has been quite harshly for the Georgian government. So, so yeah, so it's good. Mm -hmm. And so what are other implications from this case to human rights movements in Georgia? And it's a, it's a really positive precedent, um, especially knowing that LGBT people are usually at the front line of the ongoing human rights struggles um, in, in most of the societies. Uh, especially because there's usually less information about gender and sexuality and uh, there's more stereotypes attached to us and it's quite easy to mobilize uh, people against us mm -hmm. and this is being used in um, very widely by different political forces including the church which is a political player here um, so I think that it's a positive precedent uh, where the government actually has to uh, um, I mean, do something about the existing practice and actually ensure that the laws that are in place are implemented. Mm -hmm. um, and in addition to this, I see. I think that this year we saw increased engagement from the from the government to um, help us organize the demonstrations. Of course, it wasn't ideal uh, because we all had to take a lot of precautionary measures of our own, mm -hmm. as well as uh, agreeing at least partially to what the, the Ministry of Interior had to offer to us. Uh, but I still think that um, this engagement also came in the wake of this ruling. Mm -hmm. So the ruling could be a really big supportive uh, factor here. Um, and I think that it will make our further advocacy work towards ensuring the freedom of assembly of LGBT people even easier. Because mm -hmm. This is a really solid ruling that we, have, we can lean on now. Um, I would also like to add that, um, as I already mentioned, the, there are these very concrete standards on the government should behave in this kind of situation. Also, I agree with Natia and, and the other um, topic as well that this year government was more um, open to the discussion and um, yeah, more open to discussion and more supportive. Although the the processes were not ideal, of course, but um, and. We do believe that this factor, that the ruling is in this way or not the other way, had a huge impact on what government did this year, and we do believe that it might have a um, positive impact in the future as well. Um, and I wanted to say something, but I think I'm not going to So, can you maybe specify a bit more in detail? Yes, okay, okay, I remember. So, there is this, <laughs> in the region, there has been a, like a wide, a wide discussion about this propaganda thing, right? Because usually LGBT rights coming from Russia, Russian discourse, and Russian narrative, in a couple of countries near the border of Russia, have the same tendency that the discussion is being um, discussion about LGBT rights is being seen as a propaganda from sexuality. Mm -hmm. In this paper, and our politicians have. A, Quite a lot of times, also said similar things. In this ruling, the, the ruling says addresses the propaganda thing quite explicitly. Mm -hmm. It says that the reaction of the government. Uh, actually, the thing is that the government, none, no officials mm -hmm. from the government have, um, as far as I've heard, commented on this ruling. Mm -hmm. But before uh, this ruling would be issued the government was much more resistant to be open to the discussion about organizing 17th of May and Yakov Day than after the ruling. Mm -hmm. Which speaks for us that the ruling had a huge, not a huge, but enough of impact on the government. 
And did you hear any reactions? What do you as you say, government officials do not comment on anything, but in general in society, did you hear any reactions on this ruling? I haven't heard. And actually, um, Eden Gawa's um, demonstration that, were, that was held on the 17th of May was not uh, about gay rights or something like this specifically, but it was specifically about, I mean, they cannot really be separated, right? But still, um, it, um, it was specifically about um, making, um, publicizing the ruling of the European Human Rights Court mm -hmm. um, and um, explicitly demonstrating couple of quotes mm -hmm. which were which we thought that were the most important to, to the public eye. Mm -hmm. So that telling the um, Georgian society that this is how European standard of human rights protection is. So this was our aim to do at the demonstration. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not sure if um, there was any much more coverage about it. within the media there was not a big coverage about it. There was some coverage that but it was more concentrated that the government has to pay some fines and it was wrong, but it was not explicitly made unclear what was wrong and how the government should have behaved. They would not go into the depth and they would not go into the, you know, like, critically analyze the rule, the text itself. Yeah, I agree on that point. I mean, there was no major coverage, so it's hard to say what the reactions of um, the general society. And so you mentioned that this, uh, this year's uh, demonstration was about to publicize this story. However, it was so close. Did you think you achieved anything by, you know, having people register ahead of time and just? I mean, we did because th there was some media coverage. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, there were a couple of major media organizations present, mm -hmm. and they filmed the the posters that we had. Um, we gave some interviews. So there was some kind of um, publicity to this, but then, of course, it, it was not enough, and mm -hmm. we hope that one day we'll be able to make it more open, so that the people that the proximity will, will be higher. Yeah, we did a different thing because um, um, we organized a small flash mob, which was more symbolic, um, specifically on Wachtanza Street, mm -hmm. and this is the street where activists in 2013 got really badly attacked. Like three people on that specific minivan had brain concussions at the end and uh, they barely got out of their alive. I mean, I think everyone has seen the footage. Um, so for us it was, um, I mean, we started this campaign a week before May 17th called The Street is Taken with a hashtag. Um, and this last uh, sort of uh, flash mob on, on the actual Bachanza Street fed into this concept where we said that you know, this street as well as any other street in the city should be um, hate free. Um, mm -hmm. So, and yeah, this street is taken basically. Um, what we want, and we invited very specific uh, media outlets, uh, the ones that are usually um, very ethical in covering um, these issues, mm -hmm. uh, which is because I think they are under great deal. Um, and I mean, I think that what we achieved was to take a step forward to rebuilding trust between us as activists and the community and uh, um, the government. Because that trust has been lost definitely in 2013. And we are always, of course, aware that you can only trust the government to a certain extent, as anyone else in life in general. But uh, in the wake of all the promises that they had made in 2013, um, what happened was absolutely appalling and um, we were quite lost for a bit because if you cannot trust the government that actually openly promises you to protect you, then, then it's really tough. So I think that um, the fact that they managed to protect three separate simultaneous almost demonstrations this year is a good sign. It's not ideal. The trust is not sort of 100% uh, back, <laughs> but it's. Uh, I think it gives us more space uh, to demand more in future. Uh, and by demanding more, I mean demanding actually full enjoyment of the rights that are guaranteed to us by constitution and by law. So I think there's more space, and this is what has been achieved this year. And 
and uh, just to make sure, if you do know if this European court uh, is it uh, legally binding or just? Um, I'm, I'm not sure if I can, I, like, I have a confidence and expertise on this, but as far as I know, um, it's not legally binding within the Georgian um, legal um, system, mm -hmm. but what it means is that it, if the government doesn't obey the the ruling and the decision that the European Court has made, uh, there will be some um, sanction, international sanctions, and Georgia might be excluded from certain processes as not obeying international law um, because Georgia is a member of the European Council, Council of Europe, and wants to be a member of the EU, etc. So it will affect a lot of issues. So it, it's not really legally binding, maybe, but it will have a lot of international pressure and. So, do you know, were there any similar cases from other countries that, uh, you know, because of freedom of assembly or something like that? They have like a bunch from Russia. <laughs> <laughs> they have this one specific activist, Alexei, which um, I think it's his life work to uh, submit the, the cases to the European Court of Human Rights. And he's doing a great job, actually, because there's been ruling after ruling after ruling in Russia. Of course, it doesn't really affect the way Russia treats LGBT people or freedom of assembly, but it's still a lot, a lot of precedents. Um, don't remember any specific other cases from countries in our regions that would be specifically on freedom of assembly. Um, from Ukraine, maybe, but I'm not sure I don't know. Russia, definitely, a lot of them. Okay, and then maybe just a bit different topic. So. You were just in Vigo, right? right? Yes. So can you tell me how, you know, can you compare, you know, what's happening in Vigo to what is in Georgia? Um, okay, so Vigo Pride was a, a big step forward because it was the first Euro Pride within the post-Soviet um, space, mm -hmm. right? And it was a huge precedent that this happened this year. Um, there were up to 5,000 people demonstrating, and we expected them to be 2,000, but 3,000 more appeared, which is awesome. Um, unfortunately, the weather was very, very good. Um, the, unfortunately, what happened was that there was still a lot of police, which um, speaks about the possible violence that LGBT people still face in this country and in different countries. But then there was a lot of political support. Um, there were a lot of embassies, international organizations present. Um, there was the 5,000 people demonstrating freely. Um, there were a couple of incidents, like some people threw egg, some people were just yelling some nasty things to us, but there was no like real physical violence or anything like that, which was very good. Um, we still saw um, a couple of posters, we could also speak about propaganda, um, but then um, the Pride was also very important, but there were a lot of events around the Pride that were, were also very important. For example, there was this conference about the LGBT activism and movement in the Eastern European countries, there was um, a meeting of um, Eastern partnership um, countries, um, LGBT organizations which came up to one statement to address the EU how to tackle certain issues that we face in, in this country. So there were a lot of political and social processes going on around the event. So I think um, overall picture is that it was a very productive um, and fruitful and a big step forward because this created a precedent of firstly having a Euro Pride within the post Soviet country. And then maybe one one more question. So when, when do you think Georgia will reach the same level? Um, actually, if you look at how, um, for example, well, it, it depends on what we're looking at, right? For example, if you look at the legal system, mm -hmm. Georgia is much ahead than any post-Soviet country, including Latvia. Mm -hmm. uh, because if you look at the illegal map, we have 30-something, yes, uh, and they have three or four points lower than us, mm -hmm. Latvia. Uh, but if you look at the real, actual situation, everyday situation of LGBT people, we are in a much worse situation. Um, and to reach that situation where we would have a pride when we would not face the physical um, attack and at least the threat of it, 
um, I think we need a couple of years, but not very far. Because if you look at how, for example, Estonia and Latvia are developing, developing in this issue, 10 years later, it was not also uh, unimaginable, right? And step by step, they have been doing steps forward, and now they have come up to this very great um, event. So I think that we're also um, doing a lot, and I feel that um, there, is a, there is some kind of um, hope and um, I would say progress. I don't like to use this word, but progress. <laughs> and this, um, and from this perspective. Although I think that it will take us more than just a couple of years, uh, because like if you, you cannot really compare Georgia to Latvia and Estonia, even though we are we share like uh, the common history, because these countries are um, the societies are very different, and there's like the actors that are. Um, present there um, and leading the political processes are also different. Um, like in our case, we have extremely polarized political um, uh, system which uses LGBT issues for political speculations, and this generates a lot of hate from uh, from the society. I mean, if you add uh, a uh, bad educational system to this, which doesn't, you know, prepare you for critical thinking or offer you any information about gender and sexuality, and you, you have an explosive combination, mm -hmm. basically. Uh, you also have the church, which is also dra trying to drag, you know, this towards their side, also using the same issues. I mean, Estonians are much more chill in this regard. Uh, they're like a largely, I would say, they're not that, that much of a believers or church goers, not quite passive. And for Latvia as well, the society is, so the political actors, political processes are different. There's less political speculations so, around these issues, which I think made it possible for the foreign minister to come out, which was like a huge step forward. In Georgia, it is still unthought of that any politician or prominent public figure would come out because, uh, exactly because there's so much ugly stuff attached to being gay. You know? mm -hmm. So I think that this will take more time than simply a couple of years. Uh, unless the state starts engaging more in awareness raising of the society about certain issues. Um, yeah, it will take longer time because we, as NGOs, we we okay, we do our best, but we have limited resources. We can only cover a certain sort of group in the society. But we cannot, our work cannot be like totally comprehensive. Um, so I think that yeah, pushing for a bit of a change in terms of like education and awareness raising of the general population that should accelerate the process. Five years ish. <laughs> Well, let's hope so. Yeah. So, thank you guys for coming. Thank you. Thank you for having us.